Welcome to the Yadi webinar on land conflict in Myanmar. I'm going to start us off straight away. My name is Rowena and I'll be hosting today's discussion. And joining us today, we have Dr. Stefan Bachtold and Laura Lundsgaard Hansen. For those of you who are new to IADI, it stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. And it's a Europe-wide network of researchers and students in all fields of development. It promotes the exchange of information to strengthen networks and also to influence decision makers. And this webinar series engages with researchers from all over the world who bring different ideas. I can see many of you have joined us today from Myanmar. Stefan is currently in Kuala Lumpur, myself in Australia, Lara in Switzerland. So while it is a European association, there is a lot of global engagement. And if you're new to IADI, I would really encourage you to check out their website. On the homepage, there is a free newsletter, which is a really good way to know about activities and research around the world. And I understand they actually have a Myanmar working group. So before going into the webinar itself, some technical points. Uh, Lara is going to speak first for about 15 minutes, which I appreciate is very brief. And I'm really grateful for both our speakers to try and cram all of their research into such a short time. And then I will introduce Stefan, who will then speak. And then that's when we have the discussion. So make a note of your questions and your ideas and your thoughts. So our first speaker today, as I said, Lara Lundsgaard Hansen, she's a PhD candidate at the Center for Development and Environment in Switzerland. And her PhD research is looking specifically at land governance in Myanmar. And the paper she's talking about today uh, was in collaboration with Florina Schneider, Melanie Führer, and many other researchers from around the world. So we're very pleased to have her join us to talk about how many things in Myanmar are connected to land and land use and how changes in land use lead to changes in things like natural ecosystems and human well-being, for example. And I hope we have time for her to also explain about the role that land and the governance of land plays in creating a sustainable and peaceful future for Myanmar. So over to you, Lara. Thank you very much, Rowena, for introducing myself and for giving us this chance to present the papers here. And also thanks to Ellen, who made the special issue possible, where we could publish. That was a really great effort. So now I'm going to share this, my screen that I can show you my presentation. Okay. Rowena, if you could give me a, a head nodding to say if it's on the screen. Great. Good, so I'm going to start. Thank you very much everyone for joining. I'm very pleased to have so many people from around the world and especially also from Myanmar. It's a great pleasure. I'm going to talk about the paper with the title Sustainable Development and Competing Claims on Land. And the title of the webinar says Land Conflict. So I would like to say we in our team, we are mostly geographers and environmentalists. So our approach to land conflicts is more about competing claims on land, so different actors claiming land for their own interests. And that's what we understand with land conflicts here. We don't talk so much about armed um, violence or anything like this in this paper. Okay, let me get started. Our study is um, also connected to the SDGs, you know, and the Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan. And the, the plan of the Myanmar government in, tries to include three debates about development in Myanmar that are going on and they're partly competing. The first one is development should be enabled through capital intensive, large scale monoculture, agriculture and industry projects. Another debate is, well, we have so many smallholders, they're the backbone of the society. We need labor intensive and small scale traditional farming, grazing and forestry practices. And other people, they say, what? Well, with there's such a rich natural environment, we need to protect and conserve the nature. So these three debates, um, they all have one thing in common. They need land for their interests. And that means it automatically leads to competing claims on land tenure on access to land and land use. And what we have observed so far is that until now, the A, the capital intensive projects have received the most attention so far. 
let's go to our study. Our study was conducted in the south of Myanmar in Tonintari region, more precisely in Yipu Township. And this is a place where a lot of things were, were happening lately. So you see a picture on the bottom left, that's a model from the Special Economic Zone near Dawei, which is planned, announced in 2010, if I'm not wrong. We have the natural gas and oil exploration and production offshore, and the gas comes through pipelines onshore and goes all the way through Thailand, crossing Tanintari Nature Reserve. We have so many oil palm concessions in Tanintari region. We have, the, as I just mentioned, the Protected Public Forest, TNR. Um, we have a lot of small smallholders in the area. You see the light greenish color in the map. So this means there are many um, plantations for pizza, nut, cashew, rubber, but also some fruit trees, etc. So this is the environment where we made the studies and we were based in a few villages. And now I would like to show you what exactly we looked at. So our research questions were, how do actor interactions shape land use changes? I think that's a pretty intuitive question. And later I will show you some drawings and there the actors are usually represented with the gray circles. The next question is, what is the role of these land use changes for ecosystem service supply and for human well-being? So that means ecosystem service supply is a concept that we used and it talks about what services people can use from nature, like water availability or subsistence crops, medicinal plants in the forest or also commercial crops. So services from nature for people. And the other concept, human well-being, I think is pretty intuitive as well. It talks about education, about bodily health, about nutrition, about housing and rights, etc. Our methods were very diverse because we were a big team with many different researchers. We used focus group discussions, surveys, interviews, mapping, transect walks, of course, literature review. And this study here is actually a synthesis of all our research in the area. And we chose to use three main language changes for this study here, which were defined by the people in the village. They said which one were the three most important ones for them. And in the synthesis effort, we drew casual loop diagrams, as you see in the picture, to see what influences the land use changes and the land use changes, uh, what impacts does that have on nature and on people, etc. Yes, so let's move on to the results. Um, as I said, we chose three main land use changes in the study. Um, in this presentation here, I will only talk about two because 15 minutes would not be enough to talk about all of them. I will skip the protected public forest, but if you're interested in this, please ask a question later on in the discussion. So I'm gonna focus now on oil palm concessions and the commercial agriculture. For the oil palm concession, here you see on the top the Myanmar state and the Myanmar state created incentives and laws that you see on the top written next to the book symbol. And these incentives and laws could be used by oil palm companies to implement oil palm concessions. I think you're all familiar with this. And this um, reverting forest and smallholders for example, cashew nut plantations into oil palm monocultures had of course a negative impact on nature, like the deterioration in water quality and availability, biodiversity, etc. And also a negative impact on local communities, as is clear for all of us, I think. There's a deterioration in land access, also a deterioration in nutrition and income opportunities, clearly. Local villagers were not happy with that. CSOs, of course, also not. The KNU, the Karen National Union, also did not agree with this, but the oil palm companies were strong enough and also supported by the Myanmar state and the military to implement this. And Stefan Bechtold, he will talk about um, a study which is also related to oil palm concessions. I'm not gonna talk more about this right now. He might do so later. 
The other land use change that we looked at was the commercial crops. Um, this is more from the focus or the perspective of small holders and medium holders, let's say. And here we again had the Myanmar state at the top um, creating incentives and laws which fostered the land use change for rubber and mixed crop plantations like betel nut, cashew nut, lime trees, etc. And in this case, we did not have just one type of actor joining this land use change, but many different ones. And we can start on the left side with regional elites. So these are mostly urban people who took this opportunity with these incentives and laws to say, okay, um, I acquire some land in a rural area and I plant rubber mostly. So this is for two reasons. Usually rubber was very um, promising at that time, even though it turned out not very promising in the end. And also by planting trees, as you might know, you can prove that this land belongs to you. So it was also a matter of a land speculation actually, so that you can reserve some land for your purpose. We also have regional but small companies who joined this phenomena as well, but we also have a lot of smallholders in the areas and they joined in. Um, they also wanted to prove that the land belongs to them. So they also started to plant permanent plantations. Um, yeah, contributed to this land use change very much as well. The implications of this land use change for the ecosystem services was mostly a decrease in biodiversity because forest is very biodiverse, as you know. Also a decrease or a deterioration in climate regulation, water supply, but not as badly as with the oil palm concessions before. And through this land rush for converging everything to plantations, we had a, an increasing land competition and prices for land, they, they sh shoot it up into the sky, it became really expensive. And this has a negative impact on local communities, so they cannot really afford anymore to buy um, or to get new land if it is available at all. Um, yeah, but it also had very positive impacts on the local people from their own perspective. They said, we benefit a lot from increased income. So we have an opportunity to, to generate income. And this in turn then enables us to send our children to school, to buy food that we want, etc. So we have here a mix of both, of positive and negative impacts for local communities. Uh, but from their perspective, they perceive it as rather positive than negative. But we really need to say it's not for all is it positive and not necessarily to a satisfactory level of positive. So it's an improvement compared to before from their perspective, but not for all and not like extreme improvement. Yeah, so these were the two land use changes that I wanted to talk about. Um, if we take one step back now and think, well, what have we learned? Um, and we have to add a few more things that we re realize when we take a step back. And this is, first of all, and very importantly, the end of the armed conflict in this area in 2012 had the greatest impact on the well-being of the local people. And this was throughout all villages, the same answer. Um, with the end of the conflict, they could move freely again. They did not need to fear all the time. They, need to, they were not involved in in um, violence or they did not experience that much human rights violations anymore as before. This was really important for them. Um, another interesting insight that we see when zooming back is that positive well-being effects for local people were only observed where villagers could really access land and where they could co-drive the land use changes. So they were also in the decision-making power um, about their land. Regarding the ecosystem services, in the overall we observed that there is a more a deterioration than an improvement. So deterioration we observed in terms of biodiversity, water flows, the microclimate, which could help to, you know, to keep the climate humid enough, etc. There are less wild plants available or accessible and fuel wood, etc. But we have a clear improvement in terms of commercial crops, which can be used and sold, which is also a positive thing 
for people. Yeah, so now let's go back to the question of sustainable development. And we ask what, what, what could be a way forward? What, what did we learn? And we see that sustained peace is probably the most crucial thing for local community in order for them to, to have a good life. And competition over land is a problem and power issues are a critical factor in there. Um, more powerful actors have more decision-making power about land. And the current land governance system does not acknowledge yet customer systems, I think as everybody here in this webinar knows. And so we conclude that if sustainable development is taking place, it is supposed to take place, it is crucial that the peace dialogue between Myanmar government and KNU and in other areas, other ethnic armed organizations continue so that we can keep peace but also that it includes land use and land governance issues in, these, in the peace dialogue that the government and the KNU, they discuss over questions of land use, land tenure, and land governance. And also in terms of keeping the ecosystem services alive, not you know, that nature dies out. <coughs> so, um, in the team, we were then also thinking, you know, and this is food for thoughts, maybe for a discussion later on in the webinar. We, we found some signs that maybe some of these land use changes and land tenure changes were used as a means of war making or peacemaking, depends on how you look at it. For example, the oil pump concessions, were they really just um, for the purpose of producing enough edible oil for the domestic consumption or is there also another intention behind that regarding war making and peacemaking and we're going to publish a, a next paper on this question later on and other relevant discussions should also emerge around what are the impacts of COVID-19 now I mean um, people they lost income opportunities for example simply by the curfew of going out at, at night time, so you cannot harvest rubber if you're not allowed to go outside and then you don't have income or the remittances, they stopped. And these people, what do they live off then? Um, what do they eat? Is there a shift in land accessibility or does anybody misuse this? And another discussion, and there's going to be a paper again as well, so we saw that all rural communities, including Bamar people, not only ethnic minority people, they highly benefit from non-timber forest products for their well-being. What does that mean then? I mean, if these lands are where the people collected are not under clear legal status, which is in favor of local communities, what does that mean in the future? Do, will they still have access to these places of collection in the future? Yeah, so these were just food for thoughts and for discussions. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, also to Rovina. And here you see also the contact of the first author of the paper, Florina Schneider, and the link to our project website. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lara. And everyone make a note of any questions or ponder that over while I introduce uh, our next speaker. From Lara's talk, it is really clear to us that land use and influencing that land use is a very complex issue. And some of you on this webinar are from the NGO civil society space, myself included. And we can naturally think that to solve uh, some of the challenges around influencing land use, that we can start by bringing together everybody for participatory talks. And that's where we need Stefan to talk to us about the reality of this. So Stefan Bachtold is an associate researcher at Swiss Peace. He is currently a visiting postdoctoral fellow at Monash University in Kuala Lumpur. His research focus is on critical post-colonial approaches, the role of new technologies in conflict and the power of power relations that are structuring peace building and aid in Myanmar and around the world. And he's going to talk to us a bit about the approach of assemblage thinking, which is in his paper, co-authored with Joan Bastide and also with Lara as well. And he's going to talk about power in multi-stakeholder land platforms and discuss whether processes like those sorts of multi-stakeholder platforms are as inclusive and participatory as we might intend them to be. So over to you, Stefan. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I will uh, try to share my screen here. 
Um, and also, thank you for everybody for joining. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to to present this research to an interested public, and also especially to to Laura for already whipping up a few of the questions that I would like to to engage with. I mean, especially when it comes to what are the links between these bigger questions of uh, land use, land conflict uh, with armed conflict, and also state building or state formation. So, I would like to um present a paper that uh, we wrote which is called uh, assembling drones activists and oil palms the implications of a multi-stakeholder land platform for state formation in myanmar it was also part of this uh, special issue and um unfortunately i think it was not made open access but um it should still be available via the authors link so if you are specifically interested and do not have access to it you can email me to to get a copy um, overall, my paper is a bit more conceptual. That's why I will start off by quickly presenting the, the research question, then give you a few ideas of the, the conceptual framework of our paper, and then go to the empirical findings and um, quickly discuss the, the conclusions and the, the broader implications of this. But I do agree with Laura that um, 15 minutes is awfully short to to especially to approach a more complex topic. So in our paper, we basically started from the empirical puzzle that as you, I guess are all aware with, that in 2011, the, the Myanmar government has announced a far reaching transition. So that was Tencent's announcement to transition to, to peace, democracy, and a more open economy. At the same time, while the government has really changed its tone and um, started to emphasize inclusion and dialogue as, as a way forward, at the same time, you can also see that land conflicts in Myanmar have actually been increasing. And this is especially the case in, in ethnic minority areas. So our research question was how to make sense of that, how to make sense of land conflict and the role in this complex interplay between state formation armed conflict and international development in, in Myanmar's borderlands. So for this paper, we used a specific conceptual framework. And I think it makes sense if I spend a bit of time to, to actually make you appreciate the difference and uh, to see where our research was coming from. And it is linked to our understanding of, the, of what the state actually is to do research on how land conflict uh, is linked to, to state formation. And for this, we used uh, the concept of assemblages, which is a post-structuralist conception. So it's not uh, the typical kind of vanilla sort of flavor uh, of ideas what a state is or how its for, uh, formation works. So I would quickly like to, to give you three different concepts of how to think about a state and then show how ours well relates to those so the most well-known conception of um of what a state actually is or how state formation works is the is the liberal model and that is very much based on the the understanding of the state as it has emerged in the, the global north so it's a very widespread understanding it's like the kind of vanilla go-to flavor and it's also common among uh, many international development actors, mainstream academia, but also the government in Myanmar. So central to this understanding of the state is that um, you would have the, the barbarian version of a state where one centralized bureaucracy, one monopoly of a legitimate force, and potentially you can combine, combine that with, uh, with the federalism. But it's mostly one entity which is there and which you can strengthen which you can improve and in this sense state formation means that you will strengthen the state institutions and improve their service delivery so it's based on the idea that if you make state institutions more efficient or effective that they are also automatically somehow more legitimate and in this view state formation and development are complementary processes which are contributing to peace and as you might guess when you think about myanmar 
to apply this kind of understanding means that you have to, to tweak it and somehow force it over a reality which might look very, very different. So when you look at it historically in how state formation in Myanmar has worked, it's, it's much more associated with, uh, with decades of violent warfare. And that is more specifically the, the campaigns by the Tamado against ethnic armed organizations. Also, you will see that um, in many ways, the state is projecting his power into areas where it didn't have access before. So not really having an automatical monopoly on legitimate force, but it actually happens via many different means. It happens via military campaigns. It happens via ceasefire capitalism, which was the, the model or the notion made um, popular by Kevin Woods. It happens through illicit economies. It happens through militias, development projects. So there are a range of different actors involved in this kind of um, production of authority. And state building and development are highly ambiguous. So to bring these two very different perceptions together, we used um, the concept of uh, assemblages that I will now quickly um, give you a short introduction to. Um, the idea behind using a different conception of what the state is, is to, to decenter that entity, the state. So in our analysis, we did not just accept the state as a given, which is there and which has always been there, but we understand it as the formation as a, as a dynamical process, which is ongoing, which is, well, based on, on ruptures and contradictions and power and conflict. And through these actually comes out something in the end, which looks like a state, but um, it is continuously made and remade. So this approach is based on the work of Deleuze and uh, Guattari. Um, and following that approach, we consider that authority is not something which is automatically there or embodied within the state. It is something which is formed in, in networks of a range of different institutions, of people's practices, of discourses, of technologies, artifacts, and so on. These different net networks are called assemblages, hence the name of the concept, and are imbued with power and tasked with addressing a societal problem. In our case, there was the land conflict. So if you think this through, then in this view, states are not really built. I mean, they're never fully built. They are continuously made, remade, unmade in, in people's practices, and that includes private actors, militias, NGOs, international investment, and so on. And through those assemblages, the state can actually reach into people's lives and thus somehow become a thing. But importantly, and this is what really sets it apart from the, the first version of how state formation works, is that it's a highly conflictive process. It's not something which just goes smoothly. And this is why we, in our paper, argue that such assemblages are one way for the state to, to extend its reach into Myanmar's borderlands. And that, that often helps, uh, that often happens with the help of international development actors. So this brings me to uh, the empirical findings uh, of our study, or more concretely, the empirical case. So, we were looking at the oil palm concession review in Taninturi that uh, Laura has already mentioned in, uh, in, in her presentation earlier. So this was a multi-stakeholder platform involving the state government, involving the Karen National Union, involving civil society groups, businesses, resident communities, international uh, institution which was facilitating the process and so on. So you can see it was a highly complex and there with many people involved. And this assemblage was tasked with addressing land conflicts around oil palm concessions in a rather contested environment because all of these actors, they would actually have quite conflicting interests. So when you consider this uh, multi-stakeholder platform, short MSP, from an assemblage perspective, an MSP cannot be seen as a, as a non-conflictive way of improving the Myanmar government's dealing with land issues. 
what we took this MSP as is actually an arena. And it is an arena for the power struggles among those different actors. So as you can understand now, this is quite different from the idea of we bring everybody together at the same, uh, the same place, um, at the same table. We discuss things, we find solutions through dialogues. All of these elements are there, but that doesn't mean that power relations miraculously disappear at the same time. So in that sense, we use this empirical case, this MSP, as a, as a way to show how international development and land conflicts are actually linked to state formation. And we are not so much interested in the, uh, the platform itself. So in our empirical findings, we found that such a multi-stakeholder platform is a highly precarious and very fragile process. What actually holds it together is a range of specific practices that we identified through our research. So the first one would be that uh, in the beginning you have to, to forge certain alignments. So that means that a range of actors are pulled into the process in the name of development and the conflicting interest that interests which actually set these actors apart are glossed over. So concretely that meant that when the platform started many civil society groups were uh, fiercely opposing it because they perceived it as a another state-led mapping project and based on their past experience they went into opposition. So in the sense they had to be specifically convinced and brought into the platform. It didn't happen automatically just because this platform was set or designed to be inclusive. The second aspect that we saw that holds such a platform together is that um, it tends to render many things technical. So the problems that are discussed in such a platform, they are often um, made a very technical question. And oftentimes it's the question of producing better maps. I mean, better maps are a part of the problem, but um, only one part. And it is actually the part that a, a technical solution can solve. So this leaves you with what we call uh, tendencies of anti-politics. So that means that within such a highly conflictive platform, what is favored are the, the technical questions. And at the same time to somehow keep people at the table to, together and to be able to keep them talking, uh, the larger or political questions are excluded. So for example, why the land, the old palm concessions were given in the first place or how the solutions coming out of this platform will relate to different understandings of land policy. These kind of questions were not openly brought up in the, in the platform to, to actually keep it going. So in that sense, the access for less influential actors in such a platform, because it's designed to be inclusive and to make it participatory, is made easier than it was previously. I mean, for example, under the ceasefire capitalism model, you basically would have um, elites who were negotiating over certain land uses and not much say for, for other actors. But then at the same time, this space that it opens up is clearly bounded. So the strong role of the government in this process ensures that the solutions are, that are coming out of it are, are not too radical and not too revolutionary, but somehow acceptable for, for most actors. And this basically leads me to, to my conclusions and implications and then afterwards I'm looking forward to, to the questions and the debate. But Overall, I think what we concluded with our paper is that this oil palm concession review, it has produced something new. It has assembled a, a novel entity which is addressing land conflicts. But at the same time, it also has broader political effects, which oftentimes are overlooked. So within these platforms, I think one way of doing development uh, was legitimized, uh, legitimized, and that was the states and international development actors of uh, doing things. And that actually tends to, to render very political contested questions to be technical. At the same time, it's also to a certain degree delegitimizes other possible forms of contestation over land. So 
for example, if you have a platform which is there and which is made to be inclusive and participatory and based on dialogue, it's very difficult to do open resistance on the side because the platform is very soon uh, perceived as the one way to address land conflict that is specifically set up for this. So it delegitimizes uh, de other possible forms of contestation like open resistance or even armed struggle. It's basically, you have to solve everything through something like this platform. This is the perception that easily comes across even if this is not intended. So the platform also extends the reach of the, the central states into, of the central state into the, into the borderlands in, in novel ways and somehow giving another model as opposed to the, the ceasefire uh, capitalism. Um, I think what really comes out of this for international development actors is to consider multi-stakeholder platforms um, a bit more critical. I mean, they have been very popular uh, these days, but what we clearly would like to, to stress, and I'm gonna repeat this over and over in the, the discussion afterwards, that multi-stakeholder land platforms are not a silver bullet for more inclusive development in, in armed conflict. I mean, they are messy, complex processes, and they are deeply entangled with existing power structures. So these power structures, they do not simply disappear just because a process is designed to be, to be inclusive. I mean, power is still at work. So it might sh take other shapes and other forms, but it doesn't disappear. And in the end, these platforms, they can have outcomes which are rather ambiguous and which can even be rather contradictory. So at the one hand, they can open spaces for, for less influential actors, but at the same time, they can also reify and reproduce very exclusive power structures at a higher level. So it makes clear that um, in the end, it is not a silver bullet to just go ahead and bring everybody to the table and say, now we have a dialogue and then everything is solved. So in that sense, it's, it's very different to consider international development intervention as, as an assemblage from the thinking that is usually done about them. And I think for us, it was rather helpful to to see this process, which is complex, which is messy, which is marked by contestation and, and resistance. Because it offers us uh, an empirical way to, to basically understand how the actual practices of people, how certain technologies, how sitting together in a workshop, how that could be tied or linked to uh, the broader questions of state formation. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and uh, I think I will close at, at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan. And thank you also again, Lara. Now we are going to open for discussion. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, please let me know in the chat, wave or just say I have a question and we will queue them up. I have uh, a couple of questions already to ask and I'm going to start with uh, Stefan because he's, He's uh, so keen to tell us that there is no silver bullet. And so, you know, we're going to ask you, uh, what is the solution? No, no, that would be unfair. But um, I think what is interesting is that you have said that uh, MSPs can legitimize inter international development actors way of doing things. So you end up with technical questions or technical solutions. As actors in that space, as international development actors, what can we do? This may not be part of the scope of your paper, but we'd be interested from, from discussion around this. What can international development actors do um, to be more aware of this? What are the other alternatives to an, an MSP? Mm -hmm. And Lara, while he is thinking about that, the question for you, um, so you talked in the example of uh, rubber and mixed crops that the benefits for the landowners were greater if they could influence land use. So I wondered if you have a little to tell us about, about how they influence land use. How, how easy was that? Uh, what were the challenges? Was it, was it is, you know, what sort of trends came out, out of that, if you have any insight to share? No, I mean, overall, I think it's, um, 
it's quite common in our field to uh, that many tools and approaches and techniques are somehow promised as a as a silver bullet. I mean, which is also because, uh, in my understanding, development cooperation is a, a field where a lot of critical thinking thinking actually happens. I mean, a lot of the the actors are trying to constantly improve what they're doing and so on. But then I think what we often forget is that there are specific limits to development cooperation per se. I mean, development cooperation is one aspect, if you look at the context of Myanmar, among many other things. I mean, there are uh, central government, there are ethnic armed organizations, there is a civil society, there are militias, there are local communities, there are business interests, there are geopolitical interests, and there's development cooperation. And as you can see, this is only one rather small part of the equation, I think. So I think for development cooperation and these kind of approaches to, to fall into this trap of reproducing technical solutions over and over again, I think it's important to do an analysis of, uh, well, in which space are you actually moving? I mean, who are the other actors? What are their interests? How do they relate to, to you as, a, as an outside actor? And what are your options in that specific um, uh, situation? I mean, that also applies to organizations which are uh, from Myanmar to consider development or the ideas that they would like to promote as political goals rather than as something which everybody automatically agrees with. So in that sense, I mean, I think it's, it might sound very, very easy to just say, okay, everything we do is political and everything we do will have certain effects on, on other people. Some of it will like it, some of it will support it, others will resist to it. And that somehow should create a bit of critical distance to what we are doing and trying to take into account that maybe our ideas are not the only ones and maybe what we think is the best version or the best solution is actually not what is wanted for or what people want. So in that sense, I think consider everything as political. And if somebody says this is just a technical thing, then become very suspicious. I think this is my one and only advice on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lara, over to you to answer your question. And uh, Stefan, while she's answering, you'll see that Edgard has uh, put a question for you in the chat for you to consider. So over to you, Lara. Thanks for the question. Um, so first about how easy or how possible was it um, to, to benefit from rubber and mixed crops? So this was easier in the, in the sense of just very normal farmers, they could access, um, let's say, seeds for rubber or little um, saplings for rubber. They could buy that from friends or from the local market, or they could grow that themselves for the beetle nuts. So there, everybody could be, you know, um, could build on its own self-initiative and just join in. And they, most of the people at that time already had land, which they used before for subsistence, for shifting cultivation. So they could get the things that they needed and just start planting themselves pretty much immediately after the ceasefire. So in this sense, it was, was easy and things were accessible all of a sudden after the ceasefire agreement with the increased mobility and market access. Um, but the the challenges there are actually pretty big there and and I'm very glad that somebody was raising this question. Um, households, they tended to have shifting cultivation and they of course shifted from one plot to another over a, a, circle, a certain time. And with the new law, for example, the farmland law said you need to plant something so that you can prove so that you can apply for land title. And that means they had to either um, you know, 
um, deforest entire land that they used and plant everything or just start with one plot and that would mean that they at the same time lose the land that they could not start planting immediately. So again that means most people then have a, a reduced size of land for their own purpose available. And we have a very big challenge also in certain areas where it's officially titled reserved forest. And this is a land category where farmers are not allowed to apply for land titles for commercial agriculture. We have that in many villages and by coincidence or not, I'm not sure this is often people where current villages live. And these, they, they did convert to rubber and beetle and cashew, but they don't have titles for this. And this leaves them with an insecurity regarding their future and their land titles in the future. Um, another challenge is by building on self-initiative, many people, they, they bought or received seeds which were not of good variety. So for example, the rubber seeds, they, once there were trees, they did not produce a very high quality of rubber and now they cannot sell it at a very good price. And people are often lacking skills, especially in the rubber area for how to scratch and how to process. So they, they are really disappointed by, by the income that they now really have compared to what was promised at the beginning. Yeah. I think I leave it to that at the moment and I'm very happy to take more questions, follow up on this. Great, thank you very much. Um, Stefan, we have a series of questions about the MSP there. There's three that have come through, but uh, you may wish to group them together or we can take a, a break. But the first one was, how aware do you think Myanmar actors are about the concept of state formation and do local counterparts see it in the same way? Actually, I think I would rather start with the... Um with the second part of the question to actually sure. define ceasefire capitalism. I think this is something which I should have done in my presentation already. But let me start with that first and then I come to the, to the second part, if that is okay. So yes, sure. ce ceasefire capitalism is a name which, a term which was coined by, by Kevin Woods. And basically it describes the period uh, uh, in the 1990s where there were ceasefires across different areas of, uh, of Myanmar. And there were no broader political solutions that came out of the ceasefires. I mean, basically, they, the ceasefires calmed certain areas and they also allowed to start development projects there or starting plantations, starting uh, agricultural investment uh, and all kinds of investments, actually. And because it was basically a few elite actors who decided to calm an area and start this kind of uh, business activities, um, hence it was called ceasefire capitalism because it did not go any further than just calming an area. I mean, obviously this had for some areas definitely positive uh, consequences for some people, while it also came with some problems. So what I propose is that um, in the situations after 2012, this model is still somehow active and is still around. It's all, it's just that it's actually supplemented by a new model, which is more based on international or Western international development actors, which are more strongly involved in these kind of assemblages. And when we ask, well, do you think that actors in Myanmar are aware about the, the concept of state formation? Some of them are. Some of them are not. I mean, the same applies to the international community. Many people who are uh, in international development cooperation, some of them might be aware that there are different conceptions of how a state actually comes into being. Others might not be. But then I think it is mostly a rather academic notion of trying to understand, okay, how are states formed in the end? But it has very practical implications because it will shape the strategies that different actors employ when they go about something like a, like a transition in Myanmar. And for example, when you look at the discourse of the, of the Myanmar government throughout this transition, it was in many ways based on the notion that, well, we can end this conflict by dialogue and by actually bringing development 
through many of uh, through many of the of the areas. So basically, oftentimes the um, solutions to decades of armed conflict were reduced to well, we have to make that, that development happening, and we have to make it happen in in better ways and improved ways and so on. But I think this in itself excluded many other versions of uh, or grievances that were actually there from uh, from the different ethnic minorities. And it is somehow a shortcut that is very much in tune with um, what a lot of international actors also had in mind. I mean, in many ways, international development organizations, they do development. And in some cases, they do it very well. In others, they do it a little bit less well. But international development or development is what they can offer. So in that sense, if that actor comes in, it will produce a version which is very close to, to the conception of state building that I have um, set out in the beginning, which is trying to strengthen government, uh, governance, trying to strengthen state institutions, trying to strengthen their service delivery, because this is what actually makes development indicators go up. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, just while we're on this, um, this discussion, uh, questions come through. Is it true that MSP doesn't work well because we're in a post-conflict situation? Does that mean that MSP would work better in a non-post-conflict environment? It's a rather broad question. I mean, I certainly cannot speak for all multi-stakeholder platforms uh, on the planet in different contexts. But I think what I can add to this is that um, that power relations are playing a large role in multi-stakeholder platforms is not something which is specific to Myanmar or specific to armed conflict. I mean, in every kind of engagement between different actors, multi-stakeholders, there will be conflicting interests and power will be at play. This is the case whether you do it in Switzerland or whether you do it in Myanmar. It's just that I guess in an armed conflict environment, many of the issues might be more entrenched. They might be more, more contested. There might be even less trust to, to work on. And this is what uh, makes it more difficult, I think. Thank you. I've got a question for Lara now. And while that's going on, Stefan, if you could think about the question coming up. So about your research, uh, we have a question about the um, if you could explain a bit more about your research methods and your positionality as a researcher in approaching this topic. Uh, Lara, for you, and sorry to put you on the spot, um, special economic zones, we didn't get a lot of time to talk about them, and perhaps this will be a, a brief answer, I don't know. But um, the assumption is that there, um, there is little engagement, little benefit for citizens when land use is changed for special economic zone. Would you say that's the case? Were there findings that surprised you when, when the researchers looked at these examples? You mean the examples of the land use changes or the special economic zoning specific? Uh, the special economic zoning uh, specifically, yeah. Okay. Should I go first or Stefan? If you're ready to talk, please feel free. I try. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I agree that special economic zones, they often they don't really um, provide any, let's say, income opportunities for people just living nearby. Some might be getting a job in a factory or something or in a, in a hotel. But we observed the, a very similar situation with all these oil palm concessions, for example, that these places they need a lot of um, workers so they are there's a big creation of job opportunities but very often they're not then filled with local people and that causes uh, an influx of, of migrants from from other places usually with different skills so people who have already some experience let's say in factories or so or who have an, a bit another education than um, having experience in farming so I agree that special economic zones would not so much help farmers in, in our villages and but actually do harm because land prices are shooting up 
Um, and pollution is, is coming in for sure. And fish, we also see that the, the, the fish population has been decreased by other port projects in the area. So that would definitely happen as well in the, in the special economic zone. Do you think that answers the question or should I, should I talk a bit more about something else as well? No, I, I think that's great. And you have handily put uh, a link to the paper where people can read uh, more about the special economic zone um, and some contact details if people want to explore that with you further. So thank you. Otherwise, I'm happy to receive an email by the person who, who raised the question. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, Stefan, I am just scrolling back up to your question. Um, so it was explaining your positionality as a researcher um for coming up with this frame conceptual framework yeah exactly i mean it's um i think it's a very fair question because uh when i talk about everything being political and so on i should also situate myself in all these uh political contestations so i mean in general i uh i'm associated with a research institute uh, in switzerland and for this specific article i was actually uh asked by the organization who is um, uh, who was facilitating the oil palm review from a from international side to come on board as a as an external advisor uh, to to somehow produce a view on on what this uh, this platform is doing and what can be learned from it. So in that sense, I mean on many of the, the more detailed kind of questions of how the intricacies of this platform were, uh, were working, um, I don't have the, the information because uh, we were mostly talking about, well, what could be the broader implications? And we were using a very specific framework to write a conceptual paper of how can we use the case of the, the Old Palm Review to learn something about, about state build. So that was a bit um, the positionality. So in that sense, I'm not completely independent from that. And I'm somehow not completely part of it. I'm somewhere in the middle where I hope is usually the best part to develop critical thinking. But yeah, I leave that to the judgment of others. Great, thank you. I'd like to call on Aaron Russell. Uh, now, if that's okay, Aaron, you don't mind unmuting yourself. Um, you had an interesting question about what successful efforts you've seen by ethnic groups to challenge uh, land use designation. If you want to um, ask that to Stefan Direct, please feel free to do so. I will unmute you so you can. Or at least I think I'm unmuting you. Yeah. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I guess I, I had two questions. The, the second one was about the role of um, uh, quote-unquote ethnic uh, groups or you know, various representative groups and political action groups in, in Myanmar. Uh, in, in the natural resource domain, there's a lot of advocacy for customary tenure, uh, pushing against the virgin vacant fallow lands law uh, and uh, uh, alienation of land for private sector investors and uh, dams and, and the like. But there's also a lot of discussion in, in the, uh, by them of the pushing for decentralized or de uh, federalization of government. And um, sometimes it seems like uh, the, the, over, uh, the objective of federalization of government seems to be uh, overwhelming the discussion over local, local, uh, local decision making, uh, the drawing of maps, the agency of local stakeholders and defining how land should be used and natural resources should be used. So, this may be a very big question to, and can't be answered all in one, but I was just wondering from your observation, to what degree are um, people in, involved in the platforms that you've been involved in, the multi-stakeholder platforms, to what degree are, are the representatives, quote unquote, the representatives of ethnic and minority groups uh, more uh, actively motivated right now by pushing for uh, uh, negotiations on the, the larger national federalism questions versus, um, providing tools and really focusing on local uh, stakeholder uh, control and access over their natural resources and their land resources. There you go. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's definitely an interesting question. Um, the problem for me is a bit that I wouldn't consider myself uh, 
an expert on on land questions, and I have to say, there my knowledge is is rather is rather limited. So what I can give you is is more of an observation that maybe Lara can also complement because she would know much more about uh, these kinds of questions. But I mean, for me, what I kind of observe is that the land conflict questions they they are rather big, and there's quite a lot of organizations which or specifically set up uh, to specifically address land policies and uh, these kind of questions. And on the other hand, you do have a lot of organizations which are involved in the, in the national dialogue and, uh, and trying to support the peace process and so on. But to my understanding, these two communities of different organizations, they are rather separate, or at least this is my my kind of observation, which which is interesting because I think there would be many overlaps, but I am not sure whether there are organizations who are actually present in all these discussions equally. But this is my personal observation and I honestly do not base that on any specific data. So I'm open to, to hear other participants' uh, ideas and, um, and observations on that as well. Fantastic, thank you. And if anybody does want to reach out and comment on some of the things that so we're not putting all of the spotlight on Stefan, please feel free to wave at me so I, I can make sure you have a chance to speak. So an observation that has come through, right, to call the process, the MSC process messy, is not revealing who's profiting or who works on transitioning assets from one government um, form to the other and who plays the international community into believing that talks are able to bring peace. So this was a question from Marcus. So Marcus, if I haven't done that, just, just do, do come in. Um, Stefan, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree that um, silver bullets are a myth. They definitely are. And still, I have spent a lot of time in the, the last years of um, somehow just trying to dispel this myth. And I think this is um, kind of linked to the fact that development cooperation or also peace building for that fact has a, a very high turnover of reinventing new techniques, new approaches, and also new silver bullets that are then brought in and said, okay, so we had all these problems in the past. Now we have a new approach who is going to solve a lot of these issues. And then a lot of the institutions would jump on the bandwagon. So in that sense, I do agree. It's silver bullets are a myth and there will not be no silver bullets ever. But then I think it's worthwhile to, to keep repeating that these kind of silver bullets cannot live up to the expectations they, they create. And this is among most of the stakeholders. So I think this is, um, what you say when you call a spade should be, uh, what you say when you say a spade should be called a spade. But then I also do agree that it would be helpful to have a much more detailed analysis of everything that has been going on within the platform to meticulously on a very low level tease out what's happening, how power relations work and so on. But then this is also something which is rather difficult to, to do in an academic paper. Because quickly what you end up with is a level of detail which fills books. And books don't get published in academic journals, they get separately published as, as books, academic books. And I mean, for this, I think it's a bit due to the nature of this research project that we did not go or at least in my role, I did not go that deep that I could tell you exactly on, on who was doing what. It was more about trying to understand the, the general tendencies and work these out. But I mean, I'm happy to, to flag that for other researchers or for further research projects to, to follow up on. Thank you. Now, I'm conscious of time. I know there's lots of things to discuss and our uh, speakers have also shared their contact details. So you can also message me and I'll make sure if there is anything that hasn't been asked um, that I will follow it up. I want to see if we can end on something 
gazing to the future, perhaps. So uh, Kinzor raised the point that um, it, it's been two terms uh, have passed and land issues are still in limbo. Um, post elections, will circumstances be any better? Can we think of any any hope on the horizon? And uh, it could come from Lara or Stefan, but indeed any of you working on this issue, um, please feel free at this stage, just to unmute yourself. And you know, what, what have we got that can give us hope looking forward when we talk about uh, land use? Lara, you look poised to say something. Yeah. I hope it's gonna give us hope. <laughs> Yeah, this is a very good question. If post-election circumstances will be better, and I honestly doubt it for the moment. I, I, I'm not fully sure, but I think that the current government is also overwhelmed how to how to address all these really deeply rooted and historic land issues. So I'm not sure if they're going to manage to to solve them within the next election term. And also, you know, in, in the Tanintari region, we have had a case which was really shocking to us as well, the, the democratically elected regional, um, I say, chief minister. She, she was really pushing for, for this old pound concession review and saying um, land should be redistributed to local people. And in the end, she got arrested for, for corruption. And, and so we, I really don't see um, which of these leaders are having intention of really solving all these issues. And it's extremely complex for the, for the government to, to read addressing without making anyone angry. And that also refers back to the question that Aaron was say, um, posing, are local communities actually involved in, in fighting against this VFV law? And to my observation, I, I didn't see any because usually local communities, they don't even know on which land category they live on. So they cannot really um, say to which law they refer to. And I only observed this at national level more where the land core group, for example, is trying to engage or other CSOs and NGOs to, to push for the government to change certain things. And I, I personally see the, the biggest hope in this group national level CSOs that are really trying to engage again and again in the political process for the new land law, for example, new land committees. Yeah. Great, thank you. Any further thoughts from you, Stefan? You're on Sorry. mute, by the way. Yes, yeah. I just noticed that, thank you. Um, I, mean, I don't know, usually I, I'm not the person that people are looking to in the end to make a hopeful statement. Um, however, I, I will try. I mean, I think overall what um, strikes me when looking at, at Myanmar land conflicts and so on, yes, obviously there are a lot of problems and in some areas these are increasing. But then I think still the, um, the way that this debate or these discussions uh, are held nowadays is very different from the way in which they were held if compared to the 1990s, for example. So even if there is still a lot of power at play and a lot of exclusion at play, I think the general space that is there for different actors to, to engage and to or already to speak their mind is bigger than back then. Maybe it's shrinking at the moment, but um, it's still like in comparison to the, the different decades, I think there still is hope that things might be possible if people keep engaged and people try to make a change. Thank you. I think you did very well there to give us some hope. And, and as you said, the, the space has certainly changed over decades. And, and also, as your concept tells us, it is fluid and dynamic and changing. And so we must be too to, to keep occupying the spaces that are remaining for us. I'd like to thank all of you very much for attending. I know for some of you it is getting late at night and I'm really grateful for you all for engaging. This will be recorded and tidied up and sent out uh, to you. Um, and it, I'll also include links to the papers, um, a blog, and if the research, researchers are okay, I can also include presentations as well. If there was anything that's missed, uh, please feel free um, to email myself, email Iadi, or indeed email the researchers, and, uh, and we will reply to you. 
And don't forget that if you are new to EAD, we really recommend um, signing up for the free newsletter. Um, it is packed full of open access research, webinars, and uh, has a Myanmar working group as well. And last but not least, thank you to Stefan and Lara for um, squeezing so much knowledge into such a short time frame and answering all of these questions. Thank you. Thank you for thank organizing you it. Okay. And have a good evening, everybody, or good day, wherever you are around the world. Bye. Bye-bye.